Well, hello, writers. Welcome to episode number 164 of How Do You Write? I'm Rachel Heron. So pleased you're here with me today. I am talking to Amy Austin on avoiding head hopping in fiction. And you're going to love this episode. She was truly inspiring to me. And I swear to God, when we got done talking, I googled home listings in Budapest. So uh, you're going to really enjoy this episode. So hold tight for that. A little update about what's going on around here. Well, those mini podcasts have kind of been helping uh, keeping you apprised. You'll already know perhaps that my dog died, which sucks. It is Thursday as I record this and she died on Saturday and I'm just not over it. I am just not over looking down at the ground and she's not there to step over. Um, she was just the dog of my heart. So that happened. What else has happened? Oh, since the last time I actually posted a an interview podcast, it's been a couple of weeks. I did my money episode, a couple of mini episodes. And uh, in between that time, I went out to Seton Hill and taught fiction in their MFA program for popular fiction, which is just the best program around. I did that. Um, but between traveling and dog loss, and I left on January 1st, I really feel like my year just started this last Monday. Everyone else kind of started with their goals. And I didn't. I was just working. I was I was in Pittsburgh for nine days and then came home and hit the ground running with the dog. And then, so she died on Saturday. And on Monday, I, I guess I had grieved enough on Saturday night and Sunday to allow me to get to the page on Monday, uh, which was helpful. Sometimes I believe that when you're in grief, work can really help. And sometimes you just can't work. It depends on the level of grief, the kind of grief, who it was, that kind of thing. But I, I found that I was able to not only work, but to plan uh, a new, like a, a look ahead. So I wanted to mention, I haven't mentioned it in a while, um, but Adrian Bell, who is a friend of mine, you might know her from the podcast, The Misfits Guide to Writing Indie Romance. She is doing a challenge this year called Write Hella Words. And I love this challenge. She's got a ton of people doing it. WriteHellaWords.com. You can go sign up. It's a Slack channel, basically, where you post your goal for the year in writing words, and then you come back and you remain accountable. It is not too late to join my friends. It is still January. You could join in February or March and say what you wanted to get done for the rest of the year. I did my numbers and my goal is my, uh, I would like to write 450,000 words in 2020. It's almost a half a million. I think that Adrienne's going for a million, uh, half a million as well. Uh, mine isn't quite up that high. What I am doing is something a little bit new and I don't think I've talked about it on this podcast I'm pulling back a little bit and I'm giving myself a little bit more space and grace in doing this job because honestly if I write a book in four months three months to write it and one month to revise uh, that is a great pace for me and of course there'll be more revisions down the road with my editor or whatever um, but that's a really great pace pace I am not going to beat myself up for that and make myself work faster Joanna Penn, I think, once said when she realized that she just couldn't keep up with the pace that a lot of people are trying to write books at, it allowed her to step back and say, that's not my pace. And I am stepping back and saying a book every two months, a book every three months is not my pace. I'm obviously not performing at that level. So what does it really look like? And this is what it really looks like for 2020. 20 days a month, which gives me weekends off or it gives me days off in the month and I'll make up for them on weekends if I need to. So for 20 days every month, 1,500 words of new fiction. That is less than I usually push myself to do. I usually push myself to do between two and four. Sometimes when I write 4,000 words in a day, I don't write for the next two days because I feel depleted. 1,500 words, on the other hand, is pretty darn easy for me. I write and write and write, and you know, half an hour, 45 minutes, I look over and go, oh, I hit it. Great. I'm done. I'm done with new fiction for the day. And what that means is contracted new fiction. So the thriller that I'm writing under contract. That always feels pretty work a day, that kind of word, that kind of um, those kind of words. So what I'm adding is an element that I stole from an interview that is coming up, I think, next week from two artists. One of them said that he introduced play back into his 
into his work day and I am incorporating play. I'm having about an hour or about a thousand words, whichever comes first, of play every day. And what it means is I sit down and I write whatever I want. If it's fiction, it's not likely to be fiction, but if it's fiction, I write it. If it is, it's usually creative nonfiction so far, just, you know, journaling, but a little bit expanded um, into the essay format and is which is what I love to write the best. And it's just been such a joy. I write my 1500 words first, and then I write my 1000 words of play. And while I'm writing my 1500 words first, I'm looking forward to the play that's coming up. So that's really, really been working for me. So I'm going to do that cycle for three months at a time, and then spend one month revising whatever it is that I have. So basically, I've got three four month cycles in 2020. All told, for the uh, kind of contracted fiction that I sell, that'll look like 270,000 new words in 2020 if I maintain that really doable pace um, with a stretch goal of 180,000 words of play words for a total of 450 new words. The main goal, though, is that 270,000 words of new fiction, which is three books in a year. That is awesome for me. That's a pace I used to be at. I'd like to be at it again. So writehellowords.com if you would like to sign up and get on the Slack channel is really great and I would love to encourage you to do that. Okay, another thing to remind you about if you haven't heard about it, I think this is only the second time I'm mentioning it on the podcast, um, probably will be the last time I mention it on the podcast because both sections are almost full, but I am teaching 90 Days to Done in which you write your novel or your memoir. Both are constructed the same way in 90 days with me. It is an intensive masterclass, you and 11 other people. Uh, It gets really tight, really bonded, and people finish their books. Um, I have a quote from a student from that class. Rachel pushed us hard. (laughs) Let me start that over. Rachel pushed us to write hard and fast and inspired so many of us to get out of a scared bubble and simply get the words on the page. I am truly inspired by her and all she was able to teach me. I feel so much more confident about my writing skills and they will only continue to get better from here with all the tools she's provided. Thanks to her, I remember why I love and have a need for writing in my life. And I love that. So if you're interested in 90 Days to Done, which runs February, March, April, you can go to rachelherron.com slash 90 days to done. 90 is the word, the rest is spelled out. Sorry, 90 is the number, the rest is spelled out. 90 days to done. And I'm also doing a section of my 90 day revision, which is super exciting. You bring your book that you have written, or at least written most of, as long as it's 80 to 90% done, you can do this. But it has to be pretty close. Uh, Otherwise, I would not sign up for this. That's at rachelherron.com slash revision. And in this class, we actually do revise whole books. We learn how to do that first major scary revision, which a lot of writers balk at. And here is a testimonial from a student. Revision was an impossibly scary mountain before I took this class. Now I know my way up that mountain as if I'd been raised on it. This class will teach you how to not only look at your book from the 30,000 foot level, but will help you get the work done on the ground. I started and finished my huge revision in her class, and now I'm querying agents. Super exciting. So if you're interested in that, rachelherron.com slash revision. I've got one class in the, uh, one spot in the 90 days to done, and I've got three or four left in the revision class. Um, So if you're interested, go join that. And I also, speaking of awesome things and awesome people, I have a few shout outs for Patreon subscribers who signed up over the last few weeks where I've been talking about other things. Thank you to Andrew Mueller, Amanda Gibson, Kate Craik, Michelle Reed, Deb Sinis, that's how I'm going to say it. Uh, thank you, Deb. Barbara Cam and Lori Ninkhauser. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, all of you who support me over at Patreon. It uh, means the world. You get those essays to read, which I love writing. You can always look at that at patreon.com slash Rachel. And now let's get into the interview with Amy Austin. (laughs) You're going to love it so much, as much as I did, I'm sure. Enjoy. I wish you very happy writing this week, my friends. And don't forget to play. 
don't forget to have fun. It's astonishing to me that this is my job and I get to do it. And I still sometimes forget about play. I still forget to enjoy what I'm doing. So reminding myself of that and going out to look for it and finding it has really been wonderful. If you're not enjoying what you're writing, take a break from it. Do something completely different. There is a part of writing, of course, that is difficult and it's not enjoyable. And that happens many, many, many days. But if you're burning out and you really need a break, take a break. Don't push yourself through that. Often push yourself through it. But if you're really feeling burned out, take a break, do some play, or just add some extra play. Add 15 minutes of play at the end of your session. Uh, it's really working for me. So happy writing, my friends. Well, I could not be more pleased to welcome to the show today, Amy Austin. Hello, Amy. Hey, how are you? I'm so glad to, be glad to here. see you. This is great. Let me give you a little bit of bio. Amy Austin is the author of the Casey Court crime fiction series. Casey is almost always in trouble. Amy's full-time job? Rescuing her. Good thing Amy's got experience. She practiced family and criminal law in Cleveland, Ohio for several years, so she has the skills for the job. When Amy isn't rescuing Casey from herself, she's raising her son or traveling between Budapest and Los Angeles. So I have to ask about that. Budapest. How did that? How did that get started? So for years, to be quite honest, I was looking for like a, a place for refuge to hang out, um, and I went to a lot of cities. And I actually went to Budapest by mistake because I made a I made a geographical error. <gasps> I was supposed to be in Vienna, but I was like, oh, I, I was in Prague, and I thought, oh, I, I want a three hour train ride because at the time my son was two. And, and then um, I went to go apply the train tickets, and I look at it, and it was six hours. And I was like, oh, I picked the wrong city. <laughs> but, you know, at that point, I was like, all right, well, whatever. And so I got on the train, and I got off, and I was like, oh, my God, I'm home. Like, this is the place I've been looking for. That's amazing. So I went back four months later and bought an apartment. What do you love about it? Oh, my God. So I'm from New York City. So it's like New York in the 70s. So if that's your jam, oh, then that, that would be awesome. it. So it's beautiful old buildings. The food is exactly the food I grew up with, like heavy Eastern European food, yeah. which I love. Bakeries on every corner with like really hearty pastries with lard and butter, which I love. So all of that old buildings, great architecture. Like So where I live in Budapest, it actually looks like the street I grew up in Brooklyn. So it's just because I can't, you can't go back. And I live in Los Angeles and that's certainly different. Yeah, so it's beautiful yeah. architecture, beautiful museums. There's 150 museums more or less. And so I go to a different one every day. Um, I walk around, I take pictures. I go to, I can go to the puppet shows with my kid, but I can also go to the ballet and theater. And so all is, of that I love. And plus that? public transportation. Oh my God, that sounds amazing. My wife and I have been maybe looking around for another place to go. I have a New Zealand citizenship, so that's kind of our, our ticket out. But um, but what's the cost of living like there? So it's very low. So Eastern Europe, so it was on the other side of the Iron Curtain. So yeah. even though they're a capitalist country now, I think the per capita income, I want to say, is about 13,000 euros per person per year. Wow. So everything is about at that scale. So a loaf of okay. bread is maybe 80 cents. Now, how uh, do you, how, how do you, I'm sorry that I'm just, this is not where the podcast was going to go, but I'm fascinated. Fine. Um, How, how do they accept Americans? Like, what's the visa look like there? So I had to apply. So it wasn't good. So I, I overstayed. <laughs> you know, you're not supposed to overstay. Right. But I overstayed. <laughs> and a friend of mine, so there's an um, Lisa Marie Rice, who's an author who lives in Italy, um, she writes thrillers as well. At some point, we were in Los Angeles together, and she was like, so how are you staying? She's like, do you have a visa? And I was like, no, I don't have a visa. And she was like, you can't just overstay. <laughs> and I was like, I'm an American, I can stay overstay anything. <laughs> and so she was like, what I think I need you to do is you need to apply for residency. And I was like, oh, that's a good idea. So I actually I went back and I looked it up. And it's just a lot of forms. I mean, yeah, if, you, if I was yeah. in the EU or any other country, you'd be except for US or China, it would be easier. Right. But I am where I am. So I filled out a lot of forms, a lot of forms. I had an interview and I had to get like clearance that I was not a criminal both here and there and a lot of stuff. But I have permanent residency, which includes health insurance and all of that. So now I know, I know that's what I do. And that's what I do when I go, I get all my health care. That's but, what I want um, to go to New Zealand for is to, for the so freaking health care. So I stay, um, so I no longer overstay. Uh, 
<laughs> so I can stay more than 90 days. <laughs> that is so cool. All right. You just added a city to my list to investigate. Thank you very much. I for highly, blowing highly, my highly mind. recommend it. I mean, it's beautiful. And if I'm there, I would be happy to show you around. Okay. If you're there, and I know, go I lo- and I know many authors there. <laughs> I did not expect to go there. That is so cool. Um, Let's go to writing process, because I know that you write a lot. Um, And you have written under different pen names, which we will not bring up here. Um, But what does your writing process look like? How do you get the words done? So it's really mundane and boring, to be quite honest. So I get up every morning. And I don't like to write in the mornings. But after having a child, I found out that I had to write in the morning. Mm -hmm. So I used to write Okay, I used to write like in the afternoon. So I'd go to exercise and I'd eat and then I would like sit around and wait and then I'd, ex- and I'd write between one and eight. And then I had a child. Um, <laughs> and there's an author I know, um, her name was Lynn Marshall. She writes actually um, Harlequin Romances. So I was crying to her when he was about two and I was like, what am I going to do? I'm never going to write a book again. And she was like, so when you enroll him in nursery, you're going to write in the morning. And I was like, I'm oh, no. sorry. I don't understand what you said. It doesn't compute. <laughs> Um, I'm confused. So she said, you're going to write in the morning or you're going to write no more books. And so, yeah. That's a, that's a good friend to put it to you straight, you know? I know. And it was hard. And I was like over coffee and crying, probably also <laughs> emotional and nursing. So, I mean, a lot of stuff was happening. But I, so I write in the morning. So as soon as I drop my son off at school, I write, um, I write 1600 words a day. Sometimes it takes 90 minutes. We could have to today because I had an appointment. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it takes six hours. It's, I as mean, long it's as it hard. Gets done. Yeah. As long yeah. as it gets done. And when I get hit word, usually 1601, I close the computer and quit. I love that you said that because nobody else does that. I do that. Like if my goal is 1,000 or 2,000, 2,001, mm-hmm. I'm done. I can be in the middle of a sentence. Just, I know. Look, and I, I just know where to start. Yep. I'm like, yep. I, I'll, those I'll people who say, well, I hit a roll and I just got another 5,000. I'm like, I don't understand you. No. I've never. Most are written in a day is 2200 and that's a roll. So that is awesome. but I, that's really good to hear. But in order to do it, to be um, prolific, I just have to do it every day. And if I don't do it every day, I'm going to be quite honest. I forget. So, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's hard. I don't know what to say. Like I live with, I live with Casey. She embodies me, but I'm honest. I just forget. So I went to Hawaii for Thanksgiving with my son. We went to go see volcanoes. Um, and I didn't write for five days because I always have these plans. I dragged the laptop everywhere, but then he was having fun and we yeah, went out to eat. Yeah. Time difference. And next thing I knew I was on the flight back sleeping. So yeah, over the Pacific Ocean. So I didn't, I didn't um, write at all. So I started, um, oh God, I landed at midnight. It was horrible. But I started um, Sunday and I've written Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Uh, four days, but it's it's on a roll now. It's, yeah, so, as far as to get back goes. on the back on the train, so you write so you write on the weekends too. Is that right? Yes, because I can't. I forget the thread of the story. Yeah. So because I quit at word sixteen oh one, if I don't get up the next day, I honestly then I'm like, what was I? What was what was going to happen next? I have no idea, and I don't plot, so uh, I need to. I need to move it forward. You need to be inside the story. That is fantastic. I love that. What is your biggest challenge when it comes to writing? sitting down to write. <laughs> so I have, I'm going to be honest, two weeks ago, my housekeeper came to my house and she looks at me and she goes, there's nothing to clean. And I was like, oh. that has never happened in my house. <laughs> so it's actually a mess right now. I don't know. There's, there's going to be chips and sauce on the floor, but that's not me. Um, so I, I think two weeks ago, I found myself cleaning baseboards. Then the week before there, there are moths that fly in because I live in California. So the entryway is an arch but you know, the door, I have a door. So, but between the arch and the door, there's steps and all this stuff. And I, there's moths. And then I thought I should get a broom and then I got a mop. And so that's really clean <laughs> today. I hose down the mats in the back of the house. So, I mean, I have, it's really hard. I organize my pens. I organize my pencils, but hey, you get it done, pillows. but you get I it. Do. You still get the work, the work done. No, yeah. but sometimes it's really hard to just sit down. So I think yeah. I texted a friend of mine the other day and I go, Okay, it's five to noon, and I drop my kid off at eight thirty. I was like, "It's five to noon. I have exactly two hours and forty minutes. Let me just send you this last text about I don't know release strategy or whatever we were talking about." I said, "But then I got to get off because I'm actually going right now." But I mean, so some days it takes a long time for just you know my brain to settle enough yes. for me to sit down and write. Oh, but, I, I really, but, really understand that. I will say this. So this week, actually, I had the great pleasure of meeting George Takei. Wow. I know. So he wrote, he wrote a graphic novel called um, 
oh, I get it. Yeah. Oh, they call this the enemy. It's getting so much Japanese great press. Mm-hmm. So he came to my son's school to speak, which was fantastic. So I'm, you know, I'm going to go at one in the afternoon. Right. But I was like, I have to get the words done before one in the afternoon. And surprisingly, I was able to sit down and do it. Well, before then, I was at noon, I was like, look at this, it's all done. Let me get dressed and go out. <laughs> so it can get done, obviously, when there's time pressure. But to be honest, some days it's just hard. And I, I don't have a good reason as to why it's hard. It's just hard. I love hearing you say it because it's something that I'm always battling too, and I don't know why. What is your biggest joy when it comes to writing? Readers? Yeah. So I love um, emails. And so I get I get a lot of emails. And because of the topics I write about are a bit I don't know. Uh, I read about foster care and sex trafficking and child molestation and Big stuff. a happy topic. <laughs> I do get a lot of sort of really grave emails with people who are like, I yeah. experienced this and I want to share this with you. So I don't want to say it's a joy, but it's a joy to know that you touch people in that way. Mm-hmm. And they send you these long, I just got an email from an 80 something year old man in Wales who was like, I know, I don't know. I'm like, where'd you find this book? But whatever. Um, and he was talking about how he had worked in the foster care program in Wales and like how it worked in the greater UK. But he was so happy to read about a book that talked about those topics because it's something that normally that doesn't get addressed. And he told me his whole life history. Oh but it's goodness. just really sort of fascinating to get those sort of emails. And then I got one from another man. And I don't, most of my men are women. I mean, readers are women. But I think the men may email more. And he, <laughs> it was so funny. He's like, um, I read your book in tears. No, he didn't say tears. He's like, water may have leaked out of my eyes. <laughs> And I was like, it's okay to say that you cried. <laughs> somebody died in a book. And I usually don't, people usually don't die in my books, to be quite yeah. honest. And so, but somebody did die. And he was like, oh, I didn't expect him to die. And it was hard and all of this. And I was like, okay. But I do enjoy the the fact that people get it. Because, you know, you, it's yeah. a very isolating experience. I mean, I'm here by myself spinning in my chair and organizing my pens. <laughs> so it's nice to know that beyond that, somebody actually, you know, gets what I'm doing. I, I also write about some some grave topics and I get some of those emails and I'm always I always feel number one really honored to mm-hmm. get yeah. that but I also feel like really obligated to send back a very thoughtful email instead of just like you know usually I just dash off emails and those I really feel like I need to take time and process and respond and to they're... because they they're not writing they're not writing 400 emails a day like we are you know that that's really special to them. Right. So, so and I do, although I, I curb it now because I don't necessarily know what to say. Like I, in on I another pandemic, yeah. I wrote about um, an affair. Uh, it was women's fiction about an affair. And somebody's like, oh, I had a similar thing happen to me. And I thought, I don't have the capacity to respond to this. So usually now, because I used to respond more, I usually just tell people, I'm really thankful that you're reading. I really like, ex- I'm very happy to share your experience. Because I am lovely, <laughs> I think, and I I always thank them for 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 honoring me with that share. And right. Hopefully that but, works. I always feel so but, inadequate in that. So do know? I. But the alternative response, which is what my friends say to their readers, um, and on lighter books, is, "Hey, could you write an Amazon review?" Exactly. And you can't and say I it can't on those. Say that. No. <laughs> so I was because the person was like, "You just can't say it right that." I was like, "No, that's definitely seems not. Like really inappropriate." Yeah, I'm sorry so, about your yeah. foster care experience. Please write a review. No. Review. <laughs> <laughs> that's a different group of readers <laughs> and so I do have a couple super fans that I love um so I hired a new assistant year, a year ago and she was reading my emails and she was like oh she's like do you know about these super fans I'm like I'm well aware of the super fans and they write reviews and so we have a different kind of conversation I love the super fans I love 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 can you share a craft tip of any sort with us <laughs> I will say this the one thing I learned I was actually I did a library talk I love Okay, I love the mission of libraries. I deeply believe in them. So I went to what's called the Hyde Park Memorial Library. is one of the hundred branches um, of the Los Angeles Public Library. And somebody asked me this last week, and I really thought about it a little bit. I think the thing I learned was actually, and this is not a tip for everyone. It's a tip for me. I had a head hopping problem. Oh, yeah. Uh, Can you first... explain what that means for people who might not know what that means? Right. So a scene happens, and both characters or one character knows what the other one's thinking without having uh, that, without clearly having that information because they're not mind readers. Right. And it was a real problem for me because I was trying to do more than one POV in a chapter. Mm-hmm. So the thing that I, the greatest tip that I've learned is I only have one POV character per chapter. 
I just, it just makes it so much easier for storytelling purposes. Because I used to think, well, I want to know what he's thinking. I want to know, there, there's like five people in the room and I want to know what they're all thinking. And it got too complicated and I could never, even with an editor, you know, hanging with a hammer over my head, I could not untangle that um, mentally. And I was like, so I started looking at books that I, that I enjoyed and I realized that like Elizabeth George, who was a really, she, she wrote, that's what I want to write. Like, oh. a, like that kind of um, yeah. social commentary, but whatever. Yeah. Um, one day, maybe I'll be her. But she, she only uses one POV. And I was like, oh, I could just pull back. Like I don't have to, everybody doesn't have to have everything right away. And sometimes I think it might make the story better because, because we don't know what everybody's thinking, because those are secrets and that it adds up to tension. Yes. Yeah. So it's the best thing I ever did when I, I wrote two books, not like that. And by the time I got to actually three and I could guess I rewrote one, but by the time I got to book four, I was like, okay, this is already going to save me a bunch of time. Oh, yay. I so, love it's that. It's easier now because I've done it for a lot of books. Yeah. Yeah. So what thing in your life affects your writing in a surprising way? So, so many things affect writing in a surprising <laughs> way. Um, the first thing was having a child. For some reason, I thought, so I wrote three or four books before I had a child, and I wrote one when I was pregnant. I still read that book. It's the Under Color of Law. It's the second, third, third Casey Court book. And I still read it and go, I don't really remember this. Oh, my gosh. I, yeah. Because I was also, I had to paint and have baseboards and nesting and <laughs> doing all sorts of things like that. So I think that is one of the things that affected me the most. I didn't realize Oh, I didn't realize a lot. I didn't, I didn't realize I was going to have to change how I write. I didn't realize that it was going to influence my writing at all because I thought, well, I, I feel like I'm the same person, but obviously I have been changed, as mm -hmm. people say to you. Um, so I think a little bit more, especially when I talk about some of the stuff like now, like the book I'm writing now is a continuation of the sex trafficking story from four books ago and some of the people are underage. And I really think about that a lot in terms of like having a child. And I yeah. thought, this is really kind of devastating. That changes um, everything. Yeah. I know. It's not as uh, distant as it was before, I think is what I want to say. Yeah. I, I've had several books where, you know, kids die. And I know that if I had, a, I don't have children. And if I did, I'm sure that I wouldn't be able to write those books anymore. Period. Yes. So no children die in my books. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There you, so there. bad things may happen to them, but nobody dies. Yeah. And I really struggle with it because I look at them. I know they're characters, but I look at them and I think, Oh, your life, this trauma has really affected your life so much. And how are you going to recover? And actually I get those emails from writers, especially one character. They're like two, they're like, what happened to Stephanie? And what happened to Olivia? And I'm like, I, I'm oh, sorry. No. It's sad. Um, and I may resolve it one day. Cause I have a list of characters that are like, I don't want to say unresolved, but like hanging threads. I have a very big board on the wall with like the 50 people who are still in play. And so sometimes I think about them. That's but really, they're, they're ever recovering from their trauma. That's what they're doing. <laughs> Hopefully they're in therapy. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, what is the best book that you've read recently? And why did you love it? Uh, okay, so I'm an evangelist about this book. Ooh, yay. I love um, books that require not, evangelization. Yeah. Um, so it's called 101 Essays That Will Change the Way You Think. Ooh. It's by a woman named Brianna. She pronounces it Weist, W-I-E-S-T. Uh -huh. I, um, I had to drive. In LA, I, was, I had to drive to a show on the beach, and so that took two there's days. No, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I live like four miles or five miles from the beach, but there's no highway between where I am and there. So, and my friend was having an art show, so I did. I'm gonna go because that's important to me. So on the drive, that took like an hour there, an hour back. I started it as an audiobook, and it was like the most fascinating thing I ever read because it talks about emotional intelligence and like being I know like I'm so excited on people as a reflection of like you and your relationship with people and how it's a reflection of what you and how the things you love in people and what you love about yourself wow. so I love smart women and artists um, but the things that you did that you dislike about people the things you can't see in yourself I, I hate that I oh. hate that and I, I know. know it's true so I read, so I, I drove and so I listened to the book once and then um, I had to drive to Palm Springs um, for a school event. And so I listened to it again and then I ordered it because I'm like, I got to read this. And so it's on my nightstand with a highlighter and every night, it's 100 months, every night I like read an essay 
and sort of think about it. But it really is, it's made me think a lot more about people, relationships, and how people perceive others and perceive themselves. Oh my gosh. I have been really, really all about recently untangling stories that we tell ourselves um, about ourselves. So it, I'm literally just going to go one click that after we get off. It's the best. <laughs> I can't. I, w I can't. It's so it's brilliant and beautiful and wonderful. Oh, thank you so, so much. That's why I love asking this question. Speaking of books, tell us about a, a little bit about where you can be found and about Casey Court and maybe where she is in the series and, and all of that. So Casey, I love Casey. So Casey's I'm going to be honest. So Casey's an underdog. Oh, um, love an underdog. She came out of law school. Um, she crossed a, a very influential family or two and was unable to get a job. So she's self-employed, she hung out a shingle and she practices law. She is <laughs> always on the verge of bankruptcy, it's not going well. Although she just got a new car in book eight, so I'm all excited for her. Because <laughs> she had a car that wouldn't, every time she turned it off, like the motor, the motor would shudder, but the car wouldn't quite turn off. Oh, I used to have that car, I remember that car. So yeah. she has, so she's got a new car. Her parents, like, they realized how bad it was for her and so they just bought her a new car. Um, so that's very exciting, but she, it doesn't help. It's like, I'm writing about this right now because somebody looks at it, they go, but you have a new car. And she's like, well, they bought it for me. So I don't have a payment, but I don't have any more money either. So I'm still where I was. I have a paid for car, but I'm still broke. Right. Right. Um, so anyway, I'm, there are seven books in this series, the seventh, eight, well, I'm writing the book eight, the seventh book just came out. It's called no child left behind. Um, it's actually about her father. So her father was 11 born child. So during World War II, um, Hitler had a, I don't call it, a program, I don't know if that's not a right word, where they wanted to raise the next generation of Aryan children. Mm -hmm. um, and so when they discovered that, and this is still actually a problem in Europe right now, when women were not having babies at a rapid enough rate, despite incentives, mm -hmm. um, they kidnapped children from all over Eastern Europe. So Yugoslavia, Poland. I did not know that. Oh my God. So I, it was a research rabbit hole two years ago. Wow. Yeah. But hundreds, hundreds of thousands of children, they kidnapped them. And often if the children, and they forced them to speak German and not and forget, I guess, their native language. So Casey had been working on adoption cases and her father was having all these problems. And she's like, what's the problem? Helping people like do international adoption and aren't I a great person? And so he finally revealed to her that he was Levin's born baby. And so he went back to Poland to find, to try to find his original family. I have but, goosebumps all over me. I have to read this. Another so, one click is going to happen. Um, so it's, um, so it's a little frolic and detour cause she's in Cleveland, usually bad on and out cases, but he was so, I don't want to say passionate. He had a lot of thoughts about her adoption practice and she was like, but this is a way to make money and I'm not in criminal court. I'm not in juvenile court and people are not having trauma. I'm bringing happy, you know, endings to people. And he's like, adoption is not always a happy ending. So I know. So that's where we are. So that book seven came out. Oh my God, I should know the date. I don't know. In November. <laughs> in November. <laughs> November was a good month. I was traveling all of November. So I feel like I've lost November. Right, right. Um, so that is the latest one. And then the one I'm working on now is double jeopardy. So I have a, there's a bad guy in my book who has a sex trafficking ring. And in book four, it, the book is mostly about the woman who's trafficked, who was woman, girl, she was 14, 15 mm. at the time. I know. Um, I know. And he was never caught because he runs a really good operation. So I hope he's going to get caught this time. Don't tell us. <laughs> Did you say you don't know? I don't know. I just, I actually just, I had lunch with a friend who's an author and she's like, so what happens to him? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Don't you um, love plot lunches with friends? Or you're like, oh, I do. and then you could do that. And then you could do that. <laughs> I know. Trust me. She solved the problem. And actually, and then my son named the dog in the book. I needed the name of a dog for like a side character. And he's like, the dog's going to be called Moro. And I was like, like Morrow Bay, California. And he's like, yeah, I'm like, they live in Cleveland. He was like, well, then you have to come up with a story for why the dog is named Morrow. <laughs> now, That's so cute. Let's just talk about your son for a minute. He set up your like space that you're sitting in and he he's going to write he a business. my hair so that you can't see my headphones. And he's going to write a business plan for you after this. Yes, a marketing plan. And he's nine. Yeah. He sounds awesome. Please send him to my house. I would like to, I would like to engage the services. <laughs> so he um, leaves food on the floor, but he does write marketing plans. <laughs> He actually does it for my 
That's my friends, we actually float things by him. And they're like, we, so we have this conversation. They go, so, so what does your son think? And I was like, I'll, I'll go ask him. And then I tell them, we have a, you know, a Facebook group and they're like, we just do what he says. And I, we all do what he says because he, because I think he watches like all that YouTube stuff that I don't quite understand, but they're really brilliant marketers. Oh and so I think God, he's, a, right. I know. And my nephew I'm not gonna, is 10 and he has the same kind of information, but I'm not going to watch like nine hours of YouTube. No, thank you. Uh-uh. So, cause I don't have nine hours. I, I've never right. read a book, but he comes in with that information. Like the other day he was doing something and he's like, well, how come you're not drinking with the mug with your name on it? And I was like, you have a good, good. I know, right? I know. Wow. Yes, camera, in fact, I that? am advertising a cafe in Paris, you know, right now, <laughs> know. not myself. That is freaking genius. Tell him, thank you for that little tip. I know. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to have him on my show next. <laughs> he would talk your ear off for four hours and you would never be able to get him off. I'm quite honest. <laughs> and where can we find you online? Um, so, <laughs> so I will be honest. So my, um, my main writing name is Silly Fox, which is backwards I because gonna... I assume it's back. No, it's actually, it's right. They, they swapped it somewhere. I can read it. Yeah. Oh, I can't. Oh, cause yeah. mine is backwards. Yeah. Um, and it's, so I write as Amy Austin and she's A-I-M-E Austin.com. Um, it's actually my grandmother's name. Oh, um, beautiful. So to honor her. Oh, that's but she lovely. was born in 1906, so she can't still. I was like, why can't she be alive? And I was like, because she was born in 1906, so Ooh, she can't. Yeah, no. Mm. Yeah, I know. Yeah. No. Um, so, but Sylvie Fox is my name, right? Amy Austin. I used to write crime fiction under Sylvie Fox, and my readers did not enjoy it. Um, and so when I split the names, I got a lot of thank you from my script. Oh. Group, like, thank goodness, because now I know which book is which. Now, I personally think the covers are indicative enough, but that's a different conversation. Um, so I'm, I'm actually on Instagram the most lately cause I can't like, I know Instagram is the only place I only place I go now because it's all happy. Yeah. Yes. Yes. It's pretty pictures and all happy. Yes. So I'm at Sylvie Fo- at Sylvie Fox on Instagram okay. and actually you can see all my travel pictures. So I travel a lot. I'm so going right to go now, follow you. It's Hawaii. Then before that it's Houston and Crystal Beach, Texas. And then before that it's Budapest. I want to see the Budapest. So before that, I don't know where I was, maybe London, Italy, somewhere. Oh, cool. Um, have computer will travel. Um, but she's on Twitter is Casey Ann court. And then, but I don't tweet much under her cause I just don't have the time. And Casey doesn't have that much to say. She said a lot of political things and then Casey decided to back down from that. <laughs> and, um, and then, um, Amy Austin.com is where all the books are. Okay. Perfect. Well, Thank the you new s- one. <laughs> Thank you so much. It is such a delight to talk to you. You um, were talking at the end of a day and I feel revitalized and like I want to go right now. And I never do that in the evening. Never. And I probably won't. But I feel like I could after talking That's to you. great. I'm going to go cook dinner. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Actually, I'm going to go reheat dinner because I cooked dinner last night. So thanks. Thanks me. Yeah. Oh, I know. Thank you. Thank you so, so very much. I will so be having me. following everything you do. So, all right. Have a good night. You too. Bye.